Right? So last week we had our lesson from Zechariah 9, which we saw that the renewal of, of God's people is coming, and it has to affect these nearby nations. And did we learn that God is going to somehow even redeem those nearby nations, or he's going to smash them? What did he do? He talked about, I'm going to make the Philistines a part of my inheritance. Those people that you have hated so long, Israel, they will be my people too. That's the kind of God we serve, amen? Your worst enemy could be his child. Watch what you say about him. And so that was our encouragement from last week. It was a message of blessing and encouragement for those nearby neighbors, the, the Louisiana, the Oklahoma, Nebraska. But today we said that chapter 10 is paired with chapter 9. It's going to begin looking at, well, what about those big powers in the world? What about the UN? What, what about Russia? What about the, the European Union? What about these big powers that seem so much bigger than us? And we're going to look that God does have some plans for them, some plans for judgment and some plans for good. Uh, but I want to look at this next slide before we read today's passage in Zechariah 10 to help us think of the attitude of the Israelites. It was one thing whenever Zechariah was talking about them fighting with, with Philistia and Tyre and, and Damascus, you know, their, their nearby states and nations. But these are more symbols of the big dogs in the ancient world. So, so in, the, in the upper left picture there, those are a picture of the what? The pyramids, are those sort of big? Yeah? Were those built with forklifts? They were built with slaves. They were built with slaves. And so in the ancient world, the Israelites always had in their mind that we have been picked on, we have been abused, we have literally been enslaved. Not like they worked me like a dog, but literally enslaved by who? Egypt. Egypt. And what's sad in most of their history the Israelites have to be reminded, don't go back to Egypt for help. They enslaved you. They hurt you. Their gods are wrong. They hate you. They do not have your best interest in mind. But over and over, the Israelites say, oh, they're picking on me. Oh, Shishak is invading us. This is trouble. But then later, they'll say, oh, somebody else is hurting us. I guess we'll go down there for help. So they, they had this conflicted relationship with Egypt. This picture on the right side, what kind of animal does that look like, except for the weird head thing? What kind of animal does that look like? Yeah, a lion, a bull, it's got hooves, you may not be able to see. This makes us think of the other big power that always was picking on the Israelites. You know, that once they get their capital in Jerusalem, after King David and, and King Solomon, in the 700s, a new empire arises called Assyria, Assyria, and uh the, the reason I have this image up there, they were less about enslaving people and more about just completely dominating people. They were one of the first really expansionary empires in the world. Egypt just wanted control over you so they could get slaves and get money from you. Uh, Assyria was more about if you, if you don't pay up, you know, it's sort, it's sort of an extortion ring. If you don't pay up, we will destroy you. Not like we'll smash your walls and leave you crying. We will capture all of your people. We will kill all of men. We will kill all the children, and we will make you no more. We will erase you as best we can. And so this image is actually an image of one of their kings with his head mounted on this, this body of a bull with wings and, and looking like a lion. And the idea being, our kings are so powerful and so mighty, they are like gods walking on earth. And so in 722, one of these kings comes and conquers the northern ten tribes and comes and lays siege to Jerusalem. He was unsuccessful against Jerusalem. We know that in history. God preserved them. Amen? But this king, that they would say the Assyrians, the, those people from the east of us are always picking on us. And then the, the blue image in the middle. Who, who, what, what king is, is Daniel from Daniel in the lion's den under? What's, anybody remember his name? Starts with an N? Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Dar Darius is Zechariah. I like where you're going. I like where you're going. Uh, but Nebuchadnezzar, a guy in your Bible, was real in history. Did you know your Bible's real? There's a guy named Nebuchadnezzar who built this blue thing that you see there in the middle. Now, it's, it's sort of weird, and it was you know, taken from, from, from Iraq area, uh, ancient Babylon area, and brought to Germany. But they reconstructed this gate. Let me see how far big this is. Uh, let's see. This is called the Ishtar Gate. And it stands 46 feet tall. This is the day before steel. 46 feet tall. And it, it is uh, 30 meters wide, 100 foot wide. And uh, it was excavated in the 1900s. 
and it was built by Nebuchadnezzar II, the same guy who in 587 captured Jerusalem. And now the people in Jerusalem, they know eventually, especially with Jeremiah talking to them, well, did their city get captured because God made an oopsie or because they were disobedient? They were disobedient. They knew. They, they knew it was a trouble. But they still felt, as, as Nebuchadnezzar and other kings came in, and, and it wasn't just that he captured the city, he, he burned the temple, he burned the walls, he took all of their leaders. He essentially left Jerusalem a ghost town. We'll see that why well, that was part of the problem for the Jerusalem today. They said, we know that Babylon is your instrument of judgment, but it just feels like they're picking on us. You know, yes, we did some wrong, they did some wrong, but they took it way too far. You know, did they, did they have to burn the temple? Did they have to exile all of those people? And so that's why you have people like Daniel and, and, and people like Nahum who are living in exile. You know, that we can't think about that in your life. What if some invading army took us from Bastrop County and, and took us hundreds and thousands of miles away? Would you feel a little picked on? Yes. What, I mean, I messed up. Did I deserve this? You know, these guys took it too far. And we know we've had this feeling in our life, you know. You, you start a fight with your little brother, your little sister, or your older brother or sister. Do they take it too far sometimes? Yeah. Or, or you know, you're in the workplace, and, and maybe there's a tit-for-tat relationship with one of your coworkers. Ah, uh, we both did wrong, but those are the ones that did the real wrong. What we're going to see today in Zechariah 10 is God is going to address this, this idea from the people in Zechariah's day. What are we going to do with these big powers that seem so much more powerful than us? They're so much larger than us. These ones who, through all of our history, all over hundreds of years, have been picking on us. Will God smash them? Or will he do something new? What will he do with them? Zechariah 10, open your Bibles to that. We'll read from that today straight through. Zechariah 10, we're reading from God's word. Please stand if you are able. Please stand if you are able. Zechariah 10, verse 1, verses 1 through 12. Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain from the Lord, who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain to everyone, the vegetation in the field. For the household gods utter nonsense, and the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty consolation. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for lack of a shepherd. My anger is hot against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders, for the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and I will make them like his majestic steed in battle. From him shall come the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler, all of them together. They shall be like mighty men in battle, trampling the foe in the mud of the streets. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and they shall put to shame the riders on horses. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have compassion on them. And they shall be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God and I will answer them. Then Ephraim shall become like a mighty warrior. And their hearts shall be glad as with wine. Their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them and gather them in. For I redeemed them and they shall be as many as were before. Verse 9, though I scattered them among the nations, yet in far countries they shall remember me. And with their children they shall live in return. I will bring them home from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. And I will bring them to the land of Gilead and to Lebanon till there is no room for them. He shall pass through the sea of troubles and strike down the waves of the sea. And all the depths of the Nile shall be dried up. The pride of Assyria shall be laid low and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. I will make them strong in the Lord and they shall walk in his name declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Before we leave this slide, I want you to hear, this is obviously one of those poetic oracles. And yes, there's some judgment. Yes, there, there's some angst. There, there's some things going on. But overall, we talked about these poetic oracles. They may have to do with times and places and dates, but their main thing to get across is whenever you see this thing, people of Jerusalem, is, is you will feel this way. Think this way. Observe it this way. You know, having a king come and invade could be a very good thing for the people of God, that they should rejoice, or a thing that they should be sad and scared about. It depends on what God is telling them. Verse 12, though, you guys are smart enough. Help me think whether this is an a oracle of blessing and encouragement or an oracle of, of judgment and fear. It says in verse 12, I will make them strong in the Lord 
and they shall walk in his name, declares the Lord. Does that sound hopeful? Yes. God is doing something with his people. They may have all these questions and ideas of, oh, we've been picked on, or oh, we've been so wronged, but God is reminding them, who's with you? I am. God is with them. So we're going to be looking at, at this one, not quite verse by verse, but I want us to see the big emotional movements in this passage. Let's go to this next slide. How do we end up with this, with this happy ending, this encouraging ending? Well, the first introduction, so, so this is an oracle, sort of to this emotional idea of, ah, but, but we've been picked on. We know we were judged for our sin, but we've been picked on. We, the, our big brothers, those, those bigger nations were mean to us. God reminds them in verses 1 and 2, let's talk about you. Don't talk to me about them yet. Let's talk about you. Because Zechariah's job, if you remember, is to rebuild a wall and to rebuild a what? A temple. A place to worship Yahweh, the God of Abraham and Isaac. And so it sort of, it's sort of jokingly, mockingly says, ask, the, the, ask God for rain and, and God will provide and then he reminds them in verse 2, for the household gods utter nonsense. What he's pointing out in these beginning verses is in this renewal, if you really want renewal, people of Jerusalem, your small superstitions hurt big time. If you are rebuilding a temple to Yahweh that will be glorious and magnificent and people from all nations will flock to, but then you come home and you've got Nana's lucky rabbit's foot. That's a problem. That's a problem. That is double-minded. That is deceitful. What are these household gods? Um, they, they could just be tokens and mementos. Um, we know from Jacob and Rachel as he's coming back uh, from Laban in Genesis 31. Uh, Rachel, this is, this is Jacob who will be the father of all Israel. The, the, the mother of, of, most, of half of Israel. She is stealing the household god to bring home. This stuff was pervasive. It was everywhere. So it could just be this little token of like, hey, I don't think it means anything, but I just do this ritual because I learned it from my nana. You know, I learned it from her. And that's what it snuck into their lives. And some of them actually believe these gods were doing something, but none of them could answer, does this honor God? Because if they did, they would burn them and throw them out. But Zechariah knows because God has revealed to him. They still have these small superstitions, these little things they're holding onto. And then it got more intense. He talks about these diviners. Um, and some, does anybody else's Bible say soothsayer? Does your Bible say soothsayer? Look at, look at the words. Maybe they do. Maybe they do. Um, it's this idea of they would go, well, we know that God speaks through the world. I mean, God speaks through a, through a donkey to Balaam, okay? God can use the world however he wants. But a diviner was someone who said, I need a message from God. I will use the world, something created, to get there. My, my tea leaves are my telephone to God. My, my bag of bones is my telephone to God. That's getting it backwards. That, that's getting it the wrong way. If God talks to you through a donkey, you listen. But you don't go to your donkey and say, hey, I'd like to place a collect call. Okay? God is the one that does the communication. But these are people who said, my job, my way I'm going to make money is I'm going to shake my tea leaves. I'm going to use my crystal ball. And they, these are manifest today. They're still fortune tellers. They, they, so why, would, why would paper cards give you access to the divine that is ludicrous that is foolish but it was going on in israel's day and we know this is banned completely from deuteronomy 18 10 but basically they're getting their relationship with god backwards the the, the created world isn't your conduit to the divine yet you're supposed to be seeking god's word you're supposed to be seeking god's word and part of what they did is it wasn't just their tea leaves and their bones that they would shake up they would use dreams. What does it say here? It says uh, that they, the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams. Question in scripture, does God ever use dreams to communicate? Yes. Have anybody heard of Joseph? He's pretty famous for his dreams. But what we know from what Zechariah is saying is these, these diviners, these, these ones who are not just selling you their services with their bag of bones that they shake up, but also these ones that they're, they're selling you dreams. And, and so don't, don't hear me wrong. God may communicate with dreams, but we do want to think about what was going on here. These are ones who you would approach them and say, I need a, I need a word from God. And they'd say, I've got just the dream for you. You're going to get the promotion. 
their, their dreams. They wanted, they wanted positive dreams. And we see this, this over and over, even in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Uh, God is communicating to Nebuchadnezzar through a dream. And, and all the people are just telling him what he wants to hear, not what God is saying. And so the, these diviners are saying false things. And just be mindful in your life. Yes, God may talk to you through a dream. But I do want you to be mindful of the, the way it occurs over and over in Scripture. Even Joseph, who got the most positive dream. You know, you're, you're going to rule and people will bow down to you. But did it have immediate positive implications in his life? No. I want to be mindful. Most of the times God is communicating with dreams in Scripture. Whenever he communicates to Pilate's wife by a dream before he executes our Lord. Is it, a, is it a dream of blessing and, oh, you're doing great, keep going, full speed ahead? Or is it a dream of warning? Warning. God uses our dreams, our nighttime, whenever we are closed off and, and silent to warn us, you are walking into danger. So if someone is selling you, oh, here's all the positive dreams, be mindful. Be mindful. Um, so, so these diviners were just selling what they had. Oh, I have a great dream for you. You're getting the raise. You're going to be restored to the king's court. And then they find out it was a lie. It was their own thoughts, their own words. But what they needed to hear was these superstitions aren't small. They hurt big time. Oh, it's just, it's just Nana's lucky rabbit's foot. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in tarot cards, but I, I got them on the shelf. I got them from my cousin, and, you know, I want to remember them. Are those small? No, they're killers, they're killers. And they would have killed the relationship for Zechariah's people. How could they rebuild the temple of Yahweh if they were having these small idols at home? But then Zechariah turns, the, he, he goes from them, reminds them of their secret superstitions that they were hiding that they didn't think God knows about, but he does because he's actually God. And then he turns to this idea, I wrote up here, the goats will be replaced with godly leadership. This is in verses 3 through 5. There is a little bit of pity here. It says in verse 2, they are afflicted for lack of a shepherd. Verse 3, my anger is hot against the who? Shepherds. And in the ancient world, we do know, you know, obviously we hear shepherd and we start thinking of people out in the field. But the way they could talk about a ruler of a nation often was as a shepherd. There's a double meaning whenever David says the Lord is my shepherd. Not just saying God is the one who gives me nice hugs, it also means God is my ruler. And so in the ancient world, a shepherd, one that was a king that was taking care of his people in a beneficial way, could be called a shepherd. And so now we're thinking of these kings and kingdoms that have abused and not led and not encouraged. Even Israel among their own people. In adult Sunday school class this morning, we read about a king named Saul. Was he a loving and kind and thoughtful shepherd for Israel? No. He was only concerned with self. And it led the nation into quite a bit of disaster. But here's how we know that it is, it is talking about kings and kingdoms. Uh, it says here, and I will punish the leaders in verse 3. Does anyone else's Bible say something different? Or have a note? It's actually not the word for leader. Hebrew has a very precise word for leader. It's a specific word for an animal. A goat. A goat. And so we see here is there's some mocking going on. My anger is hot against the shepherd. I will punish the goats. I will punish the rams. Now maybe from time to time, will you ever at the front of a flock have a big male goat leading him somewhere? Possibly. But if he sees something better or nicer, is he going to jet off as quick as he can? Yeah. Would you, ever, would you ever say, I have my flock here being tended by a shepherd who cares them and loves them and know them by name, and say, and that's just as good as having them led by a selfish and hungry goat. No. The goat can't defend them from wolves. The goat, it, it may work for a short amount of time. But overall, that flock will be doomed. So God is, is essentially insulting these kings. They did not shepherd my people. They, they acted selfishly. They acted like goats. But the Lord of hosts, hear this church, cares for his flock. God knows his people. He is the good shepherd. Zechariah didn't know about Jesus yet, but guess what? We'll head there. But before we, before we get there, we see that he's talking about these small superstitions. They hurt. The goats will replace with godly leadership. And that's that first word. This is sort of a hierarchy of leaders in the world. From him shall come the cornerstone. And I, I got to skip to Jesus. We won't read it now. We'll get more to it at the end. What does Jesus call himself in Matthew 21, 24? I am the 
cornerstone. Jesus claims this title. Remember we said before, whenever we were talking about the triumphal entry, does Jesus know a little bit that he is the king, the promised Messiah? A little bit. The cornerstone comes from God, the head of all authority. There's a reason in Matthew 28, Jesus says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to who? Me. Jesus is the cornerstone, the linchpin of all authority. But then these other words are sort of going down the ranks. If Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt, if God's people will have success in the world, they, they will need God's chosen as the cornerstone. Zechariah is not completely sure who that is yet. But then it says, after that, it says, from the tent peg. Or, or this could be the word for a nail or a peg that you use in construction. Uh, and this refers more to a tool to get the job done. So if the city's been ruined, they're going to need walls, they're going to need a temple, and they also need people to govern. This is the job that Zerubbabel was doing. They will need good governors. If they have, if they have kings that lock the gates or kings or rulers that abuse the people, will they be successful? No, they'll rot from within. It's a good thing to have good leadership. They will need administrators and civil government. Now the battle bow this doesn't talk about your, your governors and your administrators in the cities. These are your generals. The main way that Assyria and Egypt and Babylon picked on the Israelites wasn't all through trade. It was by sending big armies. They would need successful generals like they had had in the past to lead the people. Um, and so we need to think about, especially whenever uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in, he didn't, just, he didn't just take the king into exile. He took all the people that knew how to run the city guard. He knew all the people that knew how to run scouting parties. And, and in the ancient world, if you remove all those people, you are in danger. You are in danger. But God is refreshing not just their civil leadership, but their military leadership. And here's how we know that this would have been so encouraging. It doesn't sound like anything to us, but the people in Jerusalem would have been excited. It says in verse 5, And they shall put to shame the riders on horses. Everybody say, amen. amen. See, you're not that excited, but they would be pumped. Because in the ancient world, a, a horse, a chariot is like a tank. Why did Israel lose so many battles in, in a military sense? The people in, in Judah, the people in Israel, they're just not real good at growing a lot of horses. That, the, the land isn't conducive to it. They weren't good at it. Part of the reason King Solomon, Alice and I were just reading about King Solomon, He's so famous as he is the first king to build stables after stables after stables. That's like a king that, that's like a president, you know, that is ordering the construction of aircraft carriers. We're like, oh, they're so militarily strong. So for, for Zechariah to prophesy, that your, your, your people who are leading the military will put to shame the riders on horses. It's so encouraging. But here's what we need to see. It's, it's not so they can be proud and puffed up. It's for this next thing. But we see all these I wills. And from verse 6 on, there's all these I wills. It says, I will strengthen. I will bring back. Uh, uh, I, I had not rejected them. What we see in verses 6 through 7 is this idea of relationship. Everybody say relationship. God, God is not doing this civil renewal and this military renewal so they can be off by themselves. He is doing all of this for the purpose of what? relationship relationship and we know this is the case because even back in verse three it says i will punish their leaders and we're like yeah punish the bad guys why for the lord cares for his flock god's compassion brings about renewal of relationship which brings about a renewal of strength for the people it was so important that zechariah helped the people understand it, it's not you become mighty and then God has compassion on you. It is God's passion. God's compassion is your strength. God renewing the relationship brings strength for the people. So if they're going to have all this renewal, they will have to be devoted to God. They will have to put away their small superstitions. They will have to put away bad rulers, those goats. And they will have to be given new ones by God. But it is only occurring because God is looking on them with compassion. The renewal of God's people does not begin with their, with their own offering. God, hey, I'm a big deal now. Are you ready for compassion? It begins by God looking at them where they're at and having mercy and love for them. But then this next set of I wills are a little bit different. 
I will whistle. Can anybody whistle? Ah, there you go. We'll talk about that. That's a funny one. He whistles to keep them where they are, or what? Is, what no, they come. You know, if you, we just think in our life, if you whistle at your kid, do you mean stay where you're at or come here? Come here. Come here, John Daughtry. You call them by their middle name. Whistle at them. Well, we'll talk about that. Uh, and then he says, I scattered them among the nations, but I will bring them home. All these next set of I wills, all through 812, are this idea of reposition. So say relationship. Now say reposition. If God establishes relationship with his people, he doesn't leave your feet where they are. He's going to move you, move you some way. We'll talk about all the ways and hows. But, but, but God has a sense. He knows because he knows their situation better than they do. They can't stay where they are at the way they are. Let's look at these specific uh, repositionings, that, that whistle. I'll point this out just because the most, just because I find it really interesting. I was like, what is this? I will whistle for them and gather them in. Uh, I, I don't know if your Bible does, but I was like, what is that? You know, is it a shepherd whistling? Uh, your Bible may have the note. That word whistle is more like a, to a toot or a buzz. I got to make sure I say my words right. Uh, have you ever blown a kazoo? Not your head yes, have you ever blown a kazoo? And it actually, this connects back to Egypt. This is another dig on Egypt. See, and we know this now with modern science. We know this now with the modern science. Is, is, so if you've ever been around a bee, has anybody ever kept bees? Has anybody ever kept bees? That we know that the way you make bees sleepy is by putting the, the smoke on them. What we've only now discovered is part of the way that you can actually draw bees to a spot is by emitting a specific pitch. It is a G sharp. This is true. This is, this is science. And what appears in the ancient world, the Egyptians already knew this. It's the noise that a queen bee makes uh, whenever she is new to the hive. It either means, one, kill the old queen so I can be the new queen. You know, I'm emitting my noise. Go to work. Or, come with me and we're going to start a new flock. So the idea being is the Egyptian beekeepers, because the reason it's called a land of milk and honey is because honey is very valuable. It's very valuable. They took their beekeeping so seriously, they had figured this out. And so the idea here isn't just that, that God is whistling for his dog or, or God is whistling for his flock. It's even more compelling. Whenever that queen bee made that toot, whenever that beekeeper made that noise, the bees had to act. And so that's the idea here. I will whistle for them and gather them in. Why? For I have redeemed them. Say amen if you've been redeemed by God. Amen. amen. Well, whenever he toots, whenever he whistles, you come running. You come running. And so God doesn't just renew relationship. God repositions his people. But we need to be mindful. It, it wasn't just Oh, and all of them are being brought behind the walls and getting their happy ending. See, Zechariah knows because God is showing them in verse 9, Though I scattered them among the nations, yet in far countries they shall remember me. Part of some of the repositioning, and we know this is still true in Jesus' day, as their relationship was renewed with God. They said, I'm here in a foreign country. I've been exiled. Deuteronomy was justly poured out on me. I, I was cast out. My family was cast out from Jerusalem. But they will begin to gather in their synagogues and devote themselves to God's word. And that was some of the people. They never got back to Jerusalem. They, they would be waiting for Messiah to come in Babylon, in, in, in the Greek states, in Egypt. Uh, so one day you would have uh, the deacon Stephen come upon an Ethiopian eunuch who had no business reading the scroll of Isaiah, reading it. God was preparing for his people to receive his word. But some of the people, the repositioning meant you're going to be sent back to Jerusalem and you get the fun job of picking out heavy stones. Who here would love if my church sermon was saying, hey, you guys are all going to go pick up big rocks today. That's what God wants of you. Would you like that? Yeah, it'd be a great, great message. No, you would say, not me, not today. I got football to watch. I got football to watch. No, we, uh, the people of God were repositioned. God doesn't leave your feet where you are at. And we know this is true because by Christ's day, by Jesus' day, hundreds of years later, many of the Jews have come back. And he specifically mentions here Gilead and Lebanon. This is the north of the land. This isn't completely around Jerusalem. This is what some people may call the Galilee. Ever heard of anybody from Galilee? Yeah. Maybe around Nazareth? There were hundreds of thousands of Jewish people making 
annual pilgrimages to the temple saying, God, when is the cornerstone coming? When is he coming? And so what we see is the same for us. Do we have a renewed relationship with God? Yes. If you got Jesus, hey, you're renewed. Not because you were so good, but because God had compassion on you. And for many of you, has God repositioned you? Some of you, he took from terrible spots. Nod your head, yes, if God took you from a terrible spot and put your feet someplace new. But there's still a sense, and there was in Zechariah's day, in our day, that, that when is it we finally going to be at rest? But we know in our life we were picked on. And I'm talking about those big ones. I'm not talking about that tick, tit for tat stuff. That, that may be the case for you. But some of you, you have been repositioned, you have been renewed by God, but you still have that terrible thing that happened to you. That family member did that. You went through that terrible experience that, yes, you know you were a sinner and you've messed up in life, but when do I get my rest? When do I get the restitution? When am I restored? Let's connect this to the gospel. Let's connect this to the cornerstone. This next slide, Revelation 7. And what's great about this passage is it, it follows just after the promises for, for a final renewal for the people of Abraham. Does God ever abandon his covenants? Does he ever abandon his people? No. Even if the children of Abraham forsake the Messiah and put him to death, he still has a plan. He can redeem even them. Even someone like Saul, who is the chief of sinners who used to murder Christians, he may bring into the fold. But then here, this is for God's people. This is what I want us to see today. Verse 9. Listen to the rest. Listen for the redemption, the renewal, the final rest. Verse 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to God, who sits in the throne and to the Lamb. Verse 11, And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen! Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen! Verse 13, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? Verse 14, I said to him, sir, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Here's the hope. Y'all ready? Verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more neither thirst anymore. The sun, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. No more goats. No more false shepherds. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You've been wronged in your life. You can say that firm that you've been picked on you've been bullied you've cried out for God God take care of them they're the problem you could be tempted like the Israelites well if God can't I guess I'll try something else you know the Israelites said yeah we'll build that temple to Yahweh but we're not sure he'll come through I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep a hold of Rachel's little household idol you know? I'll, I'll turn to my little superstition you know, I read, I read this word, but it's, it's okay if I have that little family thing. You might turn directly to another religion. Well, I'm just experimenting with other religions. None of those are helpful, and some are downright demonic and dangerous. Or many of us might turn to another authority or value in life, another shepherd. No, I'm not, I don't know if Jesus can lead me, but maybe my job can be my authority. Maybe, maybe my personal wealth can, can be what get, gets me meaning in life. Maybe how people look at 
me, maybe my accomplishment, maybe my, my business, that is what will guide me. Is that a shepherd or a goat? It's a goat. It is false. Zechariah 10, God is affirming, I know you've been hurt. I, I've heard about Assyria. I've heard about Babylon. And, and I will renew the relationship. And I will move you from where you are. And here's, here's what we see in Revelation. These people who have washed themselves in the blood of the Lamb, who've been through tribulation, not, not have been through ease. They have been picked on. They have been hurt. We know Christ has all authority, but do you ever have those days? Man, I feel run down and picked on. They hurt me. I'm worn out. Mom did this. Dad did that so many years ago. Hear this promise from Revelation 7. He will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God knows. He knows what they did to you. He saw it. He felt it. He knows the ways you've been oppressed, the ways you've been wrong. But guess what? Your God has a plan for the oppressors too. That the end isn't, oh, let me tell you how I can right all your wrongs. It's how he can heal you. God can redeem someone from Egypt just like he can someone from Judah. He can redeem you and he can redeem your enemy. God knows. God renews. Let's not miss this, this last slide. This message of great hope that God can restore relationship and he can renew his people and reposition them. But I got to ask first for any unbeliever. How long will you rely on false shepherds? There's only one true cornerstone. His name is Jesus. He died for the enemies of God so they could have a right relationship with God. Confess and believe in him today. But if you're saying the value in your life, the thing you are depending on for your hope and security is your job or your family or other people's opinions of you or even the the superstition. And we have people today that that build up this religious patchwork. Well, I'm sort of Hindu, I'm sort of, I'm sort of, and I do some Jesus stuff. Those are false shepherds. Can a goat take care of the flock? No. It may work for just a little bit, but then it'll fail you. And some of those shepherds will hurt you. If you're looking to your spouse to bring you meaning in life, you will be let down every time. If you're saying, oh, I'm a parent and that's my meaning in life, you will be hurt every time and you'll be just like the Israelites what's sad about the Israelites is they knew from Deuteronomy that Egypt was bad news they had been enslaved by them but you know what over and over in their history they said we can't depend on God as our shepherd let's go down to Egypt and get help guess what it led to disaster every time don't go back to those false shepherds seek the true shepherd but believer you say Jesus is my shepherd He's got all authority. I, I, I give all of my abuses and, and all the people that have wronged me over to him. But remind yourself of this. God knows the big injustices in your life. God knows. Hear that today. God knows. He knows what that person said about you. He, he knows what your parents did to you. He, he knows how that relationship ended. God knows. Do you believe he will bring you through? God knows. Do you believe he will bring you through? God knows. Do you believe he will bring you through? No matter what injustice, unfairness you are facing today, it does not move or budge or change or alter God's ability to take care of his people because he is our good shepherd. Hold on to that. And what's beautiful is even if you you waver, even if you falter, did did God renew Zechariah's people because they finally got it right? No, he renewed them because he had compassion. So even if you've been holding on to that bitterness in your heart and saying, God may know, but I got to get even, you can drop that today and experience God's grace and compassion and renewal and restoration. He's not waiting for you to get right. He's waiting for him to come in. He wants to be there and heal you. That's why in Zechariah 10, 12, he says this, 
I will make them strong in the what? Lord. He's not here to make you strong in you or your ability to get even or get right or, or be Batman and, and take care of all injustice. He wants you to be strong in the Lord and walk in his name. Restore relationship and reposition his people. So now as we move towards our time of invitation...